Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this geospatial data webinar. Um, we're still waiting for a few more people to jump on, so we'll give it a couple of minutes and we'll, we'll get started around five minutes past four. So bear with us um, while we let a few more people into the webinar. Thanks. Couple more minutes, everyone, and we will get started. We'll just let a few more people come into the session. Okay, I think we can probably kick off now. We've got a good number of people in the session. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining our geospatial data webinar. My name is Liz Dallymore and I'm the director of the WA Data Science Innovation Hub. And it is my great pleasure to um, welcome three of our amazing speakers today. So before I do that, I just would like to acknowledge um, the traditional over owners of the land in which I am residing today, which is the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so just quickly on the WA Data Science Innovation Hub. So we have been established by the WA government in collaboration with Curtin University. And our entire mission is to accelerate the uptake of data science across WA organisations. And we do that in a raft of different ways. And one of them is to disseminate deep sort of technical knowledge and case studies around different applications of data science being used in both academia and industry, which is why we are all here this afternoon. Um, so before we get into the speakers, uh, if I can just let everybody know that there is a Q&A session, which we will have at the end of the three speakers. If, uh, if you want to ask a question, can I just ask that you let me know who the question is for, so which one of our speakers the question is for. Um, and also there is an ability to vote for the best question. So that will help me um, determine which question most people want asked um, for our speakers. So if you can vote for the question that you like the most, that would be great. Um, so I will get straight into it just so that we can wrap up um, on time. Uh, and I will just say that uh, at the end of the webinar, um, I will pass to my colleague, Kate McGilvray, who will explain about our upcoming geospatial data-thon as well, which is really exciting. Um, 
But uh, as a prelude to our data-thon, these three speakers will give you examples of how they are using geospatial data in uh, interesting, fascinating and innovative ways. So if I can firstly welcome our first speaker, Professor E.J. Holden, who is the Senior Principal Research Fellow at the School of Earth Sciences at UWA. And she will be talking on machine augmented geoscientific knowledge discovery. So EJ, I'm just going to give a bit of your background, if that's OK. Um, yep. A very impressive bio, so bear with me. Um, so EJ has leading expertise in the application of data science in earth sciences. She completed her BSc, MSc and PhD from UWA in computer science, specifically in fields of computer vision and visualisation. She established and now leads the Geodata Algorithms team at UWA, and the team works closely with the resources industry to develop innovative and deployable data science solutions to assist the modelling of geology and resources. Her team's research has resulted in two industry-driven patents on machine-assisted drill hole data interpretation methods. She currently leads a major industry-funded research engagement named UWA Rio Tinto Iron Ore Data Fusion Projects. So EJ, thank you very much for joining us and I will hand over to you. Thank you, Liz. Uh, can you see it on screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Liz. Um, last 14 years, um, I've been working in geoscience. Um, with a specific aim to develop um, data science applications that can augment the interpretation of uh, geoscientific data um, with a specific aim to discover information of knowledge in the domain of geoscience. Um, this is actually the first data set that I've ever worked in uh, with in geoscience, which is the geophysics, spatial geophysics data, in this case, magnetic uh, data. Now, this data represents magnetic susceptibility variations of uh, subsurface. And uh, in this data, what people are using is to uh, map structures, which is the breaks in Earth crust. Now, um, sorry, did you actually lose that? Can you see it? No. Okay, so um, in this case that we have developed the automated light linear feature detection technique, they can actually handle the significant variations in um, contrast uh, of the feature to its background because magnetic data um, has got uh, magnetic susceptibility value variations up to about 10,000 nanotesla variations in this data set. So we had to use the in, uh, contrast invariant methods to find this liniment and delineate them and uh, generate the shape file out of this um, magnetic data. Now that uh, suite of algorithms uh, that enhance and detect and delineate these liniments were commercialized in 2010 as a plugin to Geosoft Oasis Montage, which is the platform that's industry standard uh, for spatial geophysics data analysis. Um, so this system has been deployed uh, through commercialization, had a quite significant uptake by resource companies uh, globally. However, once we actually deploy these type of systems, you realize the limitations of what your system actually does. Um, this automated analysis, of course, it can actually generate the fast and repeatable outcomes. And uh, that can be very effectively used as a first pass analysis of data. However, um, some of the features that automated analysis detect, it actually are false positives and it takes time for human effort to remove or correct. 
Now, not only that, the interpretation outcome people want from this data are not just shape files of liniments. They want to actually attribute them. And this attribute would be something like what kind of structure is it? Is it an actual um, crystal break structure or is that an actual dike? Or is there a, a lithological boundaries? And all these things need to be uh, attributed. And also, what is the chronological order of these structures? What is the first order and the second order or subsequent uh, fracture that happened after the major one? So this type of chronological order is actually quite hard to detect from our automated um, algorithms. And of course, the 3D orientation of these structures are also important. To some extent, we can automate this, but it's actually very hard to get the reliable information. So this four complex interpretation task, we learn very quickly that automated analysis can assist and or augment, but not always possible to replace human interpretation. So what is so our approach then? So from then on, we've been actually working very much in a space where we aim to build these applications, data science applications. They can actually maximize the synergy between human who actually has a domain knowledge, um, in this case, geology or geophysics, and also intuition, which is actually very hard to model by a machine. So of course, the machine solutions gives a fast and consistent output. And the approach that we have taken is that we are very much end user focused research where we have to make sure the transparency and actionability of the of data science solutions are um, preserved in your system itself. Now, to do that, we avoid black box as if possible. Um, some of the algorithms, it's very hard to be transparent like deep learning systems, but you can actually um, to various ways to avoid this black box approach as much as possible. Now, we also need to communicate the variability of input and associated output, which is again the transparency and also impact of algorithm parameters, which you can actually interactively communicate its outputs. Um, also communicating uncertainties of the outputs from computational or mathematical method is very important. Now, another thing that we need to keep in mind is how do you actually seamlessly integrate these machine solutions in current workflow of interpreters? Now, this seminar, the rest of this seminar, I will demonstrate an example system, how we approach this um, in a, a Rio Tinto sponsored project, um, which is a stratigraphic interpretation system. This is to do with the 3D spatial. Now, you guys mostly work on 2D spatial, but this is a 3D spatial down the drill hole, which is the subsurface. So the system I'm, I'm presenting here is a machine assisted drill hole data interpretation system, which is called MADI. Now, this system actually uses another system that we deployed, which is called Automated Validation Assistant, AVA, which actually to minimize the uncertainty of the input to MADI. So our focus in, is on MADI uh, within a short time frame that we have, but I will mention about how the AVA works as well. So why is a drill hole information so important? Drill hole is actually one of the, the rare events where you can actually see the ground truth, what's underneath the surface. So um, it's an expensive exercise to drill a hole. And so uh, mining companies um, collect all sorts of data out of drill hole. Now, the goal is how to actually interpret these different data sets that are coming out of drill hole and to identify stratigraphic units or strand units within the drill hole in Pilbara for iron ore operation. So the data set that we used for MADI are three. So one is the multi-element assays. So every two meter interval, rock chips comes out of this drilling. And uh, the geologist stands in this, uh, probably in summer over 40 degree heat to log the material types, which is the kind of mineralogy texture and handling properties that actually has got this code associated with those. And the log percentages of that in the rock chips that you see in every two meter interval. 
And then this chip uh, samples goes to a lab and then it gets multi-element assays, which is the geochemical assays comes, that, comes back. Now also you can actually drop an instrument and it measures the downhole geophysics measurements. Every 10 centimeter interval you can get natural gamma, magnetic susceptibility, as well as density and so on. So we have these three data sets from different modalities at different um, resolutions. Now interpretation from these multiple holes are uh, used then as a basis for block modeling, which actually modeling mineralized ore body, which is very important for efficient and uh, safe mining. So I said we have three data sets from different modalities. The, the CNN, the convolutional neural network classifiers we use, we can actually detect particular shape shale bands in this stratigraphy, which actually shows you where you are in the stratigraphic sequence in that area using natural gamma. And you can use the geological logs from the mine site logged by the geologist. And we have essays that comes in using these classifiers. So we can classify what's the likely, uh, most likely um, the stratigraphic units at different intervals down the hall as you see in the traces I see in um, yellow line um, in the figure uh, at the bottom. Now, from classifier to going into this sequence is actually a pretty difficult uh, process to present because, okay, so the CNA classifiers has presented, okay, what's the most likely uh, stratigraphic unit at each interval um, at depth. Now, you have a three different modalities who is actually giving output. How do they actually combine this for human decision is actually something that we have to think about. So the key here is how to achieve this geologically feasible solutions. And this is to do with maximizing confidence in interpretation outcomes. We are dealing with the decisions that cost money for operations, and we have to make sure we have uh, build a confidence by the interpreter using this system. So we opted for seamless integration of human and machine intelligence supported by existing data. And this is the outcome that we've done. So we have outputs from gamma and from the geological logs and assays and x-axis in these figures shows the different stratigraphic units and the y-axis are along the depth. So we have what are the likelihood units, trend units at each depth. And when you actually get output from the three CNN classifiers, um, what interpreters actually do is that they putting in um, auxiliary data sets. For example, locked stratigraphy or historical model that they already have in their organization. So we actually give this interactive visualization platform where you bring in all these uh, CNN classifier outputs as well as auxiliary, auxiliary data to interactively combine them using an image blender. So when you're actually interactively moving the weight of different outputs or different inputs in this case for visualization, and then we come up with an output that interpreter is happy with. And we learned later on that apparently truth is always somewhere in the middle of all different um, same weights. So once you have this output, we've got to optimize, go through optimization process where you're actually tracing what's the most likely strand units at each depth. So in that process, again, it's not just the optimization um, dynamic programming thing, but we've got to actually add in what is the strength sequence, strength thickness. And when there is a structure, this sequence changes significantly. So we actually also provide a 3D visualization of all the drill holes and the classified results so that the interpreter can actually modify these traces if um, wanted to actually get the final outcomes. So 
when you actually do this type of interactive visualization, integrating different data sets, um, process outputs, and auxiliary data, that we actually have a solution that can be usable by end users. Now, as I said before, these geological logs that we use for MEDI is actually a, um, logged by rig geologists, but you can't just use that kind of data for machine learning directly because it's so highly uncertain. So in this case, um, we are lucky because we actually had a, a project that's uh, prior to MEDI that we developed a system called AVA to validate is human logging when the lab geochemistry comes in to the operation. So as I said, it, these logs are composition of material types where mineralogy, texture, handling properties and their percentages. And they have what's known as material type classification scheme, which actually provides a theoretical assay values of these material types. So you would immediately think that this is a, just a mathematical optimization problem because you have a theoretical conversion of assays, hardness and lump fine splits from the material type that are logged in the, at the rig. And uh, we have a lab assays comes in. You minimize the differences between the theoretical and lab assays by modifying these logs. However, what we have learned is that that actually was um, having challenges in providing geologically acceptable solutions. So instead of going just the mathematical optimization, we have to put a lot of geological constraints. For example, how the expert swap material types and what are the existing material types in an area that coexist. So these are the machine learning approaches that we took to learn these kind of patterns and incorporated into optimization to get geologically feasible solutions. So this AVA not only used to validate logs for the MEDI, but this actually was a very important step uh, for our sponsor company for their grade estimation and managing risk in blending strategies. So they embedded in their operation. So now we have system AVA that minimized the uncertainty of human logging and we use the gamma and we are assays and the visual analytics um, platform and optimization we come up with um, drill hole data interpretation system. Now validating this type of systems in academia is very hard but in companies who has been operating there for years and years um, they have a lot of good information that we can actually validate that they already have how the manual interpreters were interpreted these um, areas. And so we can actually compare with the systems that um, they already have, the outputs and with our automated system. So just using a blending um, image blender that I showed you before, just automatically put the weights in the middle um, that everything has got an equal weight. About 85 to 87% in this validation, we actually got it right, which means that people can spend a fraction of their time to analyze these large volumes of uh, three different modality data sets um, in their interpretation using MADI, um, which saves a lot of time in comparison to their manual interpretation. So in summary, I presented an actionable um, machine learning system for stratigraphic sequence interpretation using multimodal data. Something that we should be always aim for in data science is that how to integrate the domain knowledge and computational methods or mathematical methods to actually come up with a transparent and actionable system. Uh, where especially which is important for domain specific data science application that supports human decisions with significant financial, social or environmental implications. Um, I only presented um, two systems here, but I think you can actually find a lot more activities that we are doing in our team um, through my website. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Okay. Okay.
I might just get yourself on mute. Sorry, a bit of feedback. Thank you. So uh, a very good message in, um, you know, ensuring that the solutions being developed aren't simply black box solutions that you do need to get the, the domain um, experts involved and ensure also that the solution you're developing is relevant to them and the work that they're doing as well as the data that they're collecting. So I will move um, right along to our next speaker, Dr. Mortaza Reze, who is the training coordinator for the Australian Space Data Analysis Facility. Dr. Reze um, is a software engineer with extensive experience designing and developing software tools for diverse applications. His postdoc and PhD research focused on developing tools and frameworks to insist, assist individuals on the autism spectrum become independent. Um, he's skilled in designing and coordinating interdisciplinary and inter industry collaborations, data engineering, machine learning, and communicating research findings through publications and presentations. And Mortaza's uh, talk today will be an introduction to satellite imagery. So Mortaza, I will hand straight over to you. Okay, thank you, Liz, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Mortaza and I am the training coordinator at the Australian Space Data Analysis Facility, also known as ASDAP. Um, so ASDAP was established late last year with the goal of helping Australian SMEs and researchers leverage space data. So we do this by facilitating access to high quality space data, namely Earth observation. We provide access to tools and expertise to prepare, analyze and store data. We also provide access to training and consulting services to help SMEs and researchers solve problems. We also work with universities, um, research organizations and other programs across Australia to build a stronger space ecosystem. So ASDAP is supported and delivered in partnership with a few organizations. Uh, financial support is provided by the federal government, the Australian Space Agency and the West Australian government. Uh, our work is delivered in partnership with the Pawsey High Performance Computing Centre and the WA Data Science Innovation Hub. So my goal with this presentation today is to provide a fundamental understanding of satellite imagery to help you use this data and, and make informed decisions. Specifically, we'll talk about how imagery is captured. Um, we'll talk about multispectral imagery, raster and vector data, the different attributes of imagery applications, and finally, how and where you can find satellite imagery for your projects. So satellite imagery is collected using remote sensing systems. Um, and remote sensing systems comprise of two main components, platforms and sensors. Platforms are basically instruments that support and transport sensors. Um, some examples include helicopters, aircraft, drones, kites, balloons, and, and even traffic light poles. Sensors are instruments that capture data about objects from a distance, uh, for example, cameras. And the way sensors work is that they capture electromagnetic energy reflected from objects. Um, every surface reflects some light and the amount of light reflected from an object depends on the roughness of the surface and how well a surface reflects light instead of absorbing it. Um, imagery is constructed by measuring the light or the electromagnetic energy that is reflected from an object. Um, the resolution or the quality of the data is determined by the type of sensor used and how well it measures and distinguishes between the different levels of electromagnetic energy. So electro, uh, electromagnetic energy occurs in many forms. Some examples include gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, visible light, infrared, microwaves, radios, and, and etc. And um, electromagnetic energy is expressed as either wavelength or frequencies. Uh, for most remote sensing applications, it's expressed in wavelengths. And wavelengths is basically the distance from the peak of one wave to the peak of the next. Frequency is just the number of wavelengths per unit of time. 
And the entire range of the electromagnetic wavelength or frequency is called the electromagnetic spectrum. And so this is just a visual depiction of the electromagnetic spectrum. Some waves like radio microwaves um, have a longer wavelength. On the other hand, um, X-rays, for example, and ultraviolet rays have a much shorter wavelength. And in the middle is the visible light portion of the spectrum. Only the, it's the only portion where the retinas in the human eyes can sense. And what's powerful about digital sensors in remote sensing is that these sensors are sensitive to all electromagnetic wavelengths and capture those longer and shorter wavelengths that the human eye cannot see. So now, so we've talked about how uh, sensors um, basically detect and capture light that is reflected from an object. Um, Multispectral imagery contains many bands and each band contain each of these values that is reflected of um, an object. So for example, you could have one band for the red color, you could have one band for the green color, and then you could have one band for the blue color, which, which makes up the RGB image. Other common bands include um, near infrared, mid infrared, and far infrared, which, um, which are primarily used for imaging vegetation or fires or um, measuring moisture, moisture content in soil. So when bands are combined, um, they're, they're bands can be combined to produce imagery of the data to reveal different features of an image. So when an RGB bands are combined, so when the green, red, green and blue bands are combined, um, it makes up what we call a true color image. So satellite images can have hundreds and even thousands of bands. Um, uh, satellite images that have between 50 and 200 bands, we call them hyperspectral uh, images. Um, as a reference, Landsat 8, which is a NASA um, operated satellite, has about 13 bands, the images produced by this particular satellite. And the MODIS satellite, um, which is also a NASA operated um, program, uh, has about 36 bands. Okay, so when a sensor captures reflected energy, this information is structured as cells or pixels in an image, and each pixel represents a measurement. Uh, these cells on a grid are called rasters. Digital photographs are a, great, a good example of raster datasets. Basically, a typical image that is captured by a smartphone has many pixels, and each pixel corresponds to a particular color value, so RGB value. The main point of difference between digital photography captured by a smartphone and the GIS representation or the geographic information system representation is that the GIS version, there is additional data detailing where the cell can be found on Earth and how big th these cells can be. So for example, a, a cell can represent a 50 meter by 50 meter or, uh, land on the ground with a specific latitude and longitude. And the cell size is also a limitation of raster data. So if you've got one cell that represents a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer uh, land on the ground, then you've got one unique value for every 10 kilometer square on the surface of Earth. Another limitation of raster data is that it doesn't have any meaningful boundaries. So a lake, for example, in um, a raster data set is basically a, a collection of adjacent cells that we classify as water. There's no way for us to analyze the lake as a singular object. And this is where vector data comes in. Vectors represent the world with points, lines and polygons. A point is essentially just a, a location represented by a lat and a long, or a latitude and a longitude. Um, a line is just a linear connection between points. A, a polygon is just a set of lines joined to enclose an area. Uh, so for example, in a vector system, a lake is a polygon object with a defined boundary. Um, so you can use this information to measure the size of the lake, um, the land next to it, and even measure distances from the lake to say the nearest shopping center, for example. So if you're deciding whether to use vector data or raster data, 
um, if the final mapping output or the final output of your project is to, is to deliver something that is more aligned with traditional cartographic representations, such as maps, then vector data is probably more suited for that application. But if you're intending to perform analysis, data analysis on the image, then raster data would be more um, suitable for, for that for, 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 for analysis. OK, so we've talked about how satellite imagery is captured and represented. Um, in the next few slides, I'll just talk briefly about the characteristics of satellite imagery, specifically resolutions. So resolutions determine how the data from satellite imagery can be used. And there are different types of uh, resolutions. Um, radiometric resolution, for example, is the amount of information in each pixel. That is the number of bits representing the energy that is captured. So the larger the number of bits detectable by a sensor, the higher its radiometric resolution. Uh, for example, when, when you want to assess water quality, um, radiometric resolution is, is really important because you want to be able to distinguish between the subtle differences in, in ocean color or water color. Another type of resolution is spatial resolution. And most commonly when pe people talk about resolution, um, they talk about, uh, they're, re they're referring to spatial resolution in satellite imagery. Um, and spatial resolution is defined by the size of each pixel within an image and the area on the Earth's surface that is represented by that pixel. So the finer the resolution that is lower the number, the more detail you can see. So, for example, an image on on uh, an, uh, so a satellite image can a, a pixel in a satellite image can represent a 10 meter by 10 meter land on the ground. So that's a pretty high um, resolution. Um, another type of resolution is spectral resolution, and this is determined by the number of bands, the wavelengths of the bands, and the width of the bands. So higher spectral resolution is having more and narrower bands. Um, so the narrower the range of the wavelengths for a given band, uh, the finer the spectral resolution or the higher the spectral resolution. And finally, uh, temporal resolution refers to the time between captures of images of the same area. And this is determined primarily by the platform that carries the sensor. Typically, the, the highest temporal resolution is uh, captured by geostationary systems or systems that focus on a specific area um, 24 hours a day. So we've looked at the different characteristics of um, satellite um, imagery. Um, let's compare the two different satellites that that capture satellite that, that capture images. Um, so there's Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2. So Landsat is a NASA operated um, satellite and Sentinel 2 is a European Space Agency um, uh, satellite program. So Landsat 8 captures images uh, um, uh, in 11 bands. So that, that's the spectral resolution. It has a spatial resolution of 30 meters and a temporal resolution of 16 days. So images are captured every 16 days. Uh, Sentinel-2, on the other hand, has a very high um, spectral resolution of 36 bands, but the spatial resolution is fairly low. Um, the temporal resolution, however, is, is very high. To, it's captured twice a daily, which allows us to visualize Earth as it changes day by day. So we've talked about the characteristics of satellite imagery. Um, let's talk about um, the characteristics of imagery providers. So when you want to choose the best imagery for your project, it's also important to consider the policies of the imagery provider. So things you should consider include pricing. So pricing is how much you pay to gain access to that imagery. Licensing is basically ref refers to the restrictions placed on how you can use that data. Um, and accessibility, which refers, so once you purchase um, the, the, the data, how do you get access to it? Can you download it? Is it delivered on a hard drive or is it made available via a online via a server? So those are things that you should consider before purchasing um, images. Um, th there are many uh, different applications of satellite imagery. So. Some examples include estimating agriculture yields, um, managing fisheries, um, humanitarian aid, uh, fire prevention and control, 
climate monitoring, change detection, natural disaster assessment, and, and many more. Um, let's have a look at one case study. Um, so um, Laconic is a Perth-based precision agriculture company, um, and they use satellite imagery to help farmers make better fertilizer decisions. Specifically, they determine or estimate where and how much fertil fertilizer to apply to maximize profit and minimize cost. Another Perth-based company that uses satellite imagery is MAPI. And with the use of aerial imagery, they help insurance companies make accurate property assessments. So how do you um, get access to satellite imagery? And there are many free open access um, data platforms. So if you're looking for um, uh, public data sets uh, by, published by the federal, state and local government agencies, then data.gov.au would be a good platform. Um, National Map is a, an online uh, map-based visualization tool for open government data. Um, Digital Earth Australia is a platform that uses spatial data and images recorded by satellites to detect physical changes. Sentinel Open Access Hub uh, provides free access to all Sentinel um, satellite data. Uh, Maxar Open data program. So Maxar is a commercial space tech company, but they also have an open access data portal that you can use to download um, imagery. And finally, the Australian um, Ocean Data Network that provides marine and climate science data. Okay, um, if you're looking for high, uh, high resolution, uh, temporal resolution, spatial resolution data, then, you know, commercial data sets would be probably the best approach to acquire these um, data sets. So Maxar has a commercial uh, platform that you can buy or purchase um, satellite imagery. Alula is another company um, and Planet. Um, well, that's it for me. Um, I am going to be presenting an extended, an extended version of this talk at the Datathon if you're interested. Um, thank you very much. Great, thanks so much, Mortaza, and um, shedding light on the importance of really understanding some of the um, limitations and understanding where the, the data is coming from in satellite imagery. So thank you very much. So last but by no means least uh, is our final speaker, Darren Modellini, who is the chair, um, amongst other things, of the Surveying and Spatial Sciences Institute, WA. Um, he, Darren has an extensive background in geospatial data modelling, analysis and presentation. He's currently the Digital Transformation Lead for the Public Transport Authority, identifying how data and technology can support a modern transport authority. He has previously held roles in both private and public sector organisations, delivering WA's shared location information platform, which is now data.wa.gov.au, and has put into practice data and geospatial strategies for organisation both in Australia and around the world. And Darren will be talking around more than points on a map, locating context for your data. So Darren, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Just get this up. OK, um, so share, uh, screen should be shared by now. Um, just want to uh, thank you, Liz, for the opportunity to present here today. Um, I want to talk about how location is enabling analytics in ways that might not seem obvious. I'm sure we're all familiar with maps and um, you've seen some great examples from um, co-presenters here today, um, Morteza and EJ, on the use of, of data and how to visualise that in certain ways. But I want to explore how to map support decisions and how the additional context um, may be provided either in support of a map or maybe not even using a map at all. Um, and what are the other things to consider there? So uh, to begin with, I'm sure this is a map that you're all familiar with in, in some form. Um, needs no introduction. It's the US 2020 election results. It's a map that provides, you know, a pretty clear outcome of which state had voted which way. But, you know, if you scratch the surface, there's more to the, inst uh, to the entire story here. This second image breaks it down a little bit more. Uh, it breaks down the votes by county. You can see that it paints a vastly different picture. Here it shows that um, much of the country 
potentially voted for the Republicans. So maps can, can try, uh, uh, portray uh, different stories and de depending on who you are, you might interpret it in different ways. But let's scratch a little bit further and now um, look at it, uh, the results based on population. And now you can start seeing, you know, there is potentially more to the story. Um, you know, so it provides a different context there. So what I haven't done here is provided any legends or keys to how the map could be read, which is really a key aspect on how to use location data and then what context you might want to be providing to how that data can be analysed and used. Um, and so that context provides the end user some guide towards uh, what we were looking at and making sure that we're all on the same page. So that was a bit of a view into the US election maps, but let's skip forward to 2020. And by 2020, I mean 1854, we're all dealing with pandemics these days. This is a map that some of you might be aware of. Um, it was generated by a person called John Stone, and it highlights the residences that have been impacted by cholera in London. Um, the points on the map are great. It provides some context to what John Snow was trying to achieve. And as successful as it was, the point of the map was he was trying to build context to help identify the source of the outbreak impacting London. So there's key additional questions that complement the information that you're seeing and portrayed via a map. Um, who is sick? What are the symptoms? When did they get sick? Where could they have been exposed and what could have been the cause of the illness? Something that if you're in Perth this week, um, you, you're certainly familiar with. Um, all of these things that were developed back in the 1800s helped shape modern epidemiology and epidemiology is a form of analysis, but that context becomes the crucial part of it. The map is the supporting element to it. So they do, you know, the data becomes more than just pins on a map. You need to understand the what you're trying to collect and, and what it's going to be used for. So for context, maps really do demonstrate that our brains are not hardwired to rows and columns. I mean, who likes looking at Excel spreadsheets all day? We visualise, we communicate through actions, and we're biased towards the past experiences um, that we've had, which help shape our decisions of the future. Location geospatial analysis is a real enabler in modern data analytics that combines time and place to provide rich communication medium to help understand, manage, predict and support decision making. We do this by taking layers of data and using location as a primary key of sorts to sift through the layers, identify patterns and determine influences to a location, to an activity and or to understand what is happening where. We do this using data and it's not always simply rows and columns. We also leverage other forms of data and um, as Morteza just highlighted, you know, satellite data, aerial data, survey data, um, it's all providing context, but the outcome is really what's driving um, what we're trying to do in this space. So we are really data rich. You know, everything we do now collects and creates data, but insights in the broader term can be quite lacking. Um, you think of the last major decisions um, for investment within your own businesses, you know, how much was, um, how much insight was generated by based on what are we doing and where. So the challenge facing anyone that is wanting to build data analytics is that there's so much data being generated, it's easy to get lost in it. Simply wanting to conduct an enterprise search, hey, show me what data is available, will not always give you what you want. Um, so there are some qualifying quality factors to consider here. What we do know is that spatial can be used and embedded into almost all types of data. Not necessarily everything, but quite a, a large swath. And it's used as a key to identify and to join different data sets together and begin the analysis journey. It's not the only type of analysis, but certainly it's a, it's a highly important one. Um, and not a map is not necessarily the final output. Uh, quite often I've seen uh, and been involved in a lot of uh, geospatial work that has produced reports. Um, and the context of the report is generated from geospatial data. A map is maybe used to provide some sort of context, but not always there. 
So um, as an example, a firm that provides asset maintenance services can leverage HR data um, as part of their geospatial analysis. Now, to give you an example, um, if you think about putting your, your workers out into a field to conduct different types of jobs all over the city, you need to know where your employees are, what projects they're going to be working on throughout the day. Um, do they need to be off-site all day? Are they going to be on-site? Um, where are the materials that they need to conduct their work? Um, and we can use this HR data combined with asset data to then optimise how best to structure a work day for an employee to maximise the potential amount of work that you can do. Um, and if you then think of that HR data and based on what the logistics of the, the business that they might be doing throughout the day and then combine that with asset data, you can start building uh, linkages between your business data and your geospatial data to not only precisely locate and link uh, what somebody might be doing, but you can use that information to help create the virtual world so people can start looking at and getting site context. What am I working on? Do I have all the information? Can I visualise where I need to go? Do I need to pass through a gate to get there? And so this location and geospatial element provides a real um, visualisation opportunity, but it needs to be contextualised with the richness of the data coming from different um, data sources. So you can start building um, different views based on what the people want, and, and that's a really important starting point to say, how do we build, start looking at geospatial analytics to support my business? I tend to always begin with people and process. What am I here to do today? And who needs to input into it? What are the work disciplines? And EJ really highlighted this in her talk. You know, the discipline of the type of information that we're dealing with is something that's so fundamentally important because I could be coming from one background and working with another person, another background, and we can look at the same piece of information and interpret different things from it. So are we working with the same types of taxonomies, vocabularies for the data that we're dealing with? And, and data is, is primarily then supported by technologies to enable the work to happen. It's not necessarily the driving factor for it um, to support the decisions that need to be made. Location can be a key linking element between all of these areas to raise the awareness of what data is available. But one of the most important components is to ensure that there is quality between the data captured and it meeting its intended use. So some of those quality factors um, is the data, the latest data that's available, is it current? Has it been captured um, with all complete um, attribution elements associated with it? If I'm looking at uh, multiple spans of data coming uh, across the time period, is it consistent? Does the data generated from different systems potentially all reflect the same type? <clears throat> Can I trace the data? Do I know how it was captured um, and how it relates to other pieces of information? And does the data conform to standards? Um, is it uh, uh, following a definition that I understand and everyone else understands? But Importantly, from a geospatial element, the accuracy of the information. Um, does the data reflect the real world? Is it captured in its correct location? And so why does accuracy matter so much? So when you're dealing with geospatial analytics, it's important to know the spatial accuracy of the data you're working with. Why? Well, the Earth moves. Recently, um, the geodetic datum of Australia was modernised from GDA 94 to GDA 2020. What this means is that when you're working with different layers of data, you have to be aware of the accuracy and where the how where and how the data was captured and what location reference it was captured in, so that when you're overlaying different layers of data together, they all fit together, and you've got some sort of certainty uh, when you're conducting your analysis. So if you go out there and capture data today, pick up your phone. Um, you know, uh, it's going to be based on the latest epoch of GPS positioning signal given to the receiver and the receiver in your phone or a high quality survey receiver. You then have to use the, um, process that data and, and correct it to the to the geodetic data now 2020 that you're using so that when you're comparing it and analysing many layers, it all fits together, as I said. 
in most circumstances, from the experiences I've had, the shift uh, between different datums isn't going to make too much of a difference dependent on what the person is trying to use the data for. But if you're relying on data for engineering, construction or legal purposes, then it becomes a real key factor. And that a difference of less than a metre, you know, tens of centimetres, can mean you could be putting a digger through a main utility pipe or not. Um, let's all think of the uh, issues that might uh, result if you burst a water main or a gas pipe. So it's important to ensure the quality and the accuracy of the data being used within your analytics packages is well understood. Today, uh, as we move towards more digital technologies and use digital simulations or twins in more and more scenario planning and operational support, Taking that people first approach and ensuring the quality of the data meets the outcomes will give you a good foundation. What are we trying to solve today? What do we need to get certainty about what we're trying to solve today? So a digital twin might only be seen as a visual tool, but if you're using the visualization elements of what a digital twin can give you to do simulation modeling, then it's gonna really be dependent on the accuracy of the information you feed into it and how you manage that. So I'm, I'm just about finished. I want to just give you a, a bit of an overview um, of some things to think about when you head into the datathon. But I want to leave you with some trends uh, as I'm seeing um, how geospatial analytics is, is, is really helping to shape other industries. These trends are really coming into light in the infrastructure and construction industries where planning, design, construction and operations are using geospatial to assist with lifecycle data management. So how am I collecting data in the planning phase? How am I building upon it when I move it into construction? How do I hand that over to maintain and operate so that I'm not recreating data at each step? Location plays a, a role across the life cycle as all the infrastructure is based on the land on which it operates and needs to be maintained. How it operates, what may influence its operations and what risks the infrastructure may be placed under can be analysed and managed through geospatial uh, analytic tools. So I think it'll be interesting to see how digital twins and simulation modelling and predictive asset management areas evolves in this space alongside geospatial analytics. And I'm sure there are some great challenges out there to, to start getting your heads wrapped around. So I just wanted to say thank you uh, for listening to me um, present. Uh, and in relation to the upcoming datathon, um, as Mortaza uh, outlined, uh, there are some great uh, resources out there on the web, um, data.gov.au, Digital Earth Australia, but more locally here, um, we've got uh, the data.wa.gov.au platform, uh, which has also recently just launched a, a community forum. So you can really get on there and start um, asking the questions about what data is available, uh, where do I go to find what information, um, so I recommend having a look at that. And also um, from a transport perspective, Main Roads has got a really good open data um, uh, portal as well to get uh, your hands on some transport data. So I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, thank you for the WA Data Science Innovation Hub for letting me speak and thank you everyone uh, for coming along online. Thanks so much, Darren, that was great. And a really good point in terms of, you know, always thinking about the contextual elements of, of, you know, the output of your geospatial data and also how you can leverage other data sets. I like those examples of those HR data sets. So something for people to take into the datathon as well, thinking about what other um, data sets are out there that you can give to contextualise your solution. Um, so we do have a few questions that have come through. So um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to jump straight into them. Um, people that are online, I do, will let you know that this session is being recorded and it will be um, available on the WADSI uh, website and we'll have LinkedIn posts, etc. So if you do have to jump off now before the questions are asked, that's absolutely fine. Um, we will have the recording and you can pick up on that at a later date. Um, so the first one, EJ, for you and the most voted question, thank you, Hugo, is in what environment do you develop your computer vision applications? Do you build your own software from scratch or do you use programming packages such as Python, Skiki, Kit, Learn or OpenCV or do you use commercial software? Sorry, EJ, you're just on mute there. I'll just get you to unmute. Thanks. So, yeah. 
um, OpenCV and uh, PyTorch, or um, because we, we develop a lot of different things. So, but the machine learning libraries um, are always uh, something that we use as well for development. Um, but I think at the end of the day, um, you it's just the libraries that you test and uh, you use. Um, it, it depending on the, um, the the algorithms that you test. Um, the computer vision, the CNN. Um, so you know, extracting all the features from the hidden layers of the different filtering outputs, and use that for texture, for example, analysis or recognizing or uh, classifying patterns. Um, these are the state of the art, but we, we there is a problem that uh, you always have to be aware is the, the availability of the quality and the amount of training data for your uh, machine learning. And I think that's the key that you need to look into. Um, so in terms of, you know, whether you use a TensorFlow or PyTorch for machine learning libraries or whether you use Python or use C++ or C Sharp, it doesn't really matter. But I think you've got to actually um, make sure that your training data is um, unbiased. Ethical use of training data, very important. Um, so deal with the imbalance situations of your machine learning, um, as well as um, making sure that uh, you communicate the outputs as much as you can. Yeah. yeah. Good, very good points. Um, I might throw this one to Darren. So for data scientists with no background in geospatial data, would you recommend reading, learning? What would you recommend rather reading or learning before the data phone? Do you have any tips for anyone or anyone else want to jump in? EJ Mortazra as well on that question. Well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's been so long since I've looked. Uh, I mean, it's all in your head. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's some of the, the websites that were shared in some of the presentations um, have a lot of good resources um, in terms of, of where to start. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, open source um, groups, and I suggest really just um, just even just doing a Google search. I'm, I've gone blank in terms of what they might be at the moment, um, but there's so many good open source uh, forums out there, and that's a really good, good place to start. Yeah. Um, the Open Geospatial Consortium, um, you Google that. Uh, there's a lot of good online discussion groups that happen in that space. Um, ANSLIC in Australia, um, as the Australian New Zealand Land Information Council, they've got a few different um, online uh, areas within their websites that show um, what's possible in this space and, and what to be looking out for and where to go to get started. Um, Esri itself it has a lot of great online learning tools in relation to the Esri platform, if, you, if you're familiar with that platform. Uh, it's a proprietary one, but there's a lot of good online, um, uh, what are they called, MOOCs, um, online learning courses. Uh, so that's a really great way to get stuck into it as well. Fantastic, thanks. Um, moving on, so EJ, uh, this um, anonymous question. Thanks for a great presentation. I'm guessing that part of being transparent to the end user would include expressing the uncertainty in your results. What have you found most effective in conveying uncertainty in spatial data? That's a great question. Um, we Uncertainty. Okay, so you can actually I don't know whether you're talking about machine learning or image analysis. Uh, OK, so when you actually communicate your output uncertainty, um, you think about uh, something like, you know, the recall or uh, precision um, rates. And instead of that, you use probably F1 score, which actually considers both of them. And so that's, I guess, it's a transparency in a way that you're not just giving a one score that um, probably looks good <laughs> for your output. Um, but also, um, we're talking about the imbalance um, cases of the training data for machine learning. So you probably need to put some consideration how to present it, how to actually normalize the accuracy, for example, depending on the number of um, imbalanced data. 
and also I think uh, for image analysis part, what we've done is that I, I showed you an example of very earlier work we've done of liniment detection. And um, what we've done after that uh, commercialization was just hearing all these, um, you know, the false positives that people are picking on and worrying about. So we went some very from the end user uh, viewpoint. So what would you actually use? How would you use this image analysis? Instead of just learning what's the um, uncertainty of that, can we actually capture um, the methods into the workflow where the people can actually have build some confidence in using it? So. Um, I didn't mention it, but it's in my slide that what we've done is that we had a contract with um, Geological Survey of Western Australia. We produced their product, which is called Integrated Exploration Platform, something that you can just log on and you can download this um, uh, ArcGIS and mapping for plugins. This is the platform where it has got the functionality where someone can actually draw a line on a potential field data. Um, as a structure map, um, and it actually using the automated analysis technique to guide your interpretation, which means that it's the background, it's running the automation to give you confidence on what you're drawing on. So um, this is a kind of uh, efforts that you can make to make it usable. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it comes back to sort of Darren's point around people and processes first as well, doesn't it, in that slide. Um, so next question for Mortaza, could you give some examples of how you would choose spatial resolution while trading off temporal and other resolutions? Yeah, so this one depends on the project and what you want to achieve. So if you're looking to detect minute spatial changes, then high spatial resolution would be more suited for that application. If you're, if you're looking to um, to detect changes over short time frames like hours or even minutes, then high temporal resolution would be more applicable there. But if you have the budget, you can often purchase images, very high res uh, images that, that, that are both, um, you know, uh, high temporal resolution, high spatial resolution, high spectral resolution um, and high radiometric resolutions um, that you can quite easily purchase um, those type of images. I also want to add um, that there was a typo in one of my slides. Um, I compared Landsat um, 8 and Sentinel 2. So instead of Sentinel 2, that should be MODIS. So MODIS has 36 bands and the spectral resolutions of 250, 500 and 1000. Yes, I think a couple of people picked up on that. So <laughs> thanks for clarifying that, Mortaza. Um, and just quickly on the last question before I hand over to Kate, who will talk around the, um, the data thon quickly. Um, handling large amounts of uh, satellite data, what do you recommend or what do you use um, to, to handle and process these large amounts of data. Darren, I might throw to you on that one. Um, recently, I've just been throwing it up into the Open Data Cube framework yeah. <laughs> um, and leveraging the Australian Compute Institute's processing power. Because, um, you know, when you're dealing with large amounts of data, Mortezza, you probably uh, can speak more about this recently, you know, doing that locally, you put a large overhead on, on your own business or your own area to sort of manage that data. So if you can look for those uh, frameworks there, and, and you've seen a lot through Google Earth Engine and the like um, that are providing that compute power and actually hosting that data. And what you're focusing then on is you know, writing the Jupyter notebook or in, in the processing algorithms that you want to run across that data. So look for those areas first, I'd suggest, and then um, depending on the output, then go to the higher spatial resolution and just get that data or the temporal data that you need. Yeah, yeah. Any other comments, Mortaza, EJ? Um, no. I will, yeah, no, I will just jump in quickly. Um, so this one also really depends on what your output is. Um, I mean, you can use some pretty sophisticated technical optimi optimization techniques like data compression, like PCA principal component analysis to reduce the file dimensions. Um, 
uh, but, but really depends. But I, I think one of the reasons for the high utilization of satellite imagery at the moment is because storage and processing cost is is the lowest it's it's ever been. So um, it's still pretty high, but it's it's really low compared to what it was in the past. But um, if I can just plug um, ASDAP here, if, you, if you're a researcher or an SME, uh, you can please get in touch with ASDAP and we can talk about how we can um, assist uh, you with designing workflows to optimize your process. Nice plug, Mortaza. So we might leave it there. Um, I'll just say for on the um, for people that can't see on the recording, someone has posted um, a wiki to get more information on GIS. So we will uh, post that in um, our LinkedIn along with this recording as well. So thank you so much speakers for your input. That was really fascinating. I myself learnt a lot. Um, I, I don't know a huge amount about geospatial <laughs> data science, so it was it was good to hear from you. And I understood some of it, so that's, that's very helpful. Um, I'll hand right over now to Kate, who will give everyone just a bit more information on the upcoming geospatial data thong. Kate, thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so I'll just making sure everybody can see the screen. Great, awesome. Uh, so yeah, just another thank you to uh, everybody who spoke during the data thon, uh, during, sorry, the, the webinar. It was really valuable to hear everybody speak. Uh, and I think everybody spoke a lot about the importance of uh, insights coming out of geospatial data and really looking at who you're working with and what kind of outcomes that you're trying to achieve. Uh, and I think that aligns well with what we're working towards uh, with the geospatial data thon. So uh, I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, we are partnering with uh, PAUSI Supercubing Centre uh, and the Department of Communities and also the Australian Space Data Analysis Facility. So from our perspective, the Datathon is an opportunity to bring together people who work across a range of different in industries uh, to explore challenges, opportunities and innovations presented by geospatial data analytics. This uh, event will specifically be looking at how you bring the human to geospatial analysis, and that's why we've partnered with the Department of Communities, uh, who've provided us with some real world challenges that they face in the geospatial data analytics sphere. Uh, and those channel challenges will be available to participants to work through and try to look for solutions. Uh, so those specifically will be around uh, spatial anonymization, uh, dealing with incomplete data sources, uh, and also looking at data amalgamation for emergency responses, and also separately data amalgamation for rental stress analysis. So there's more information available on our website, which steps out the specific components of each one of those challenges. Um, so if you're interested in participating, in the datathon, then you can express your interest via our website. Uh, the information will be published and live after this event, so that's the best place to go, basically. Um, so in the expression of interest form, you'll need to put in some information about yourself. We do ask a couple of personal questions about your background, so what kind of qualifications that you have and what area that you work in. Um, and that's so that if you're registering as an individual, we have enough information to put you in a team with other people um, to make sure that those teams are diverse and have the appropriate skill sets to address those challenges. Uh, then if you do wish to uh, apply as a team of individuals, um, so just to note, the Datathon isn't open to existing organisations or businesses, just to individuals, uh, but you can apply with a, a preformed team. Um, so if you want to do that, then you just need to make sure that you provide the name of your team. So in that uh, expression of interest process, you'll be able to identify or preference which challenge you'd like to work on. We ask you to give a preference um, from one to four. Um, and so that's with, so we can make sure that there's some diversity across those challenges and so that the people who we have from Department of Communities who will be 
providing support and expertise are able to do that across all the projects as opposed to the focus being in one area. So that's a little bit of, of background uh, on the datathon. In terms of the logistics of the event, uh, we will be launching the event on Friday the 14th of April uh, from 5 till 8 p.m. Um, that will be May, Kate. Oh, it's in May, May sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong date there. In May, yes. Um, and at the moment, we're looking to hold the event at, tech, at the Technology Park Function Centre in Bentley. Uh, so at that event, we'll have a couple of initial speakers talking about the datathon and talking about the value of, of looking at geospatial data in these areas. Uh, and then basically, we'll just be opening up for teams to start engaging with each other, to start asking questions and looking at their challenge. Uh, and there'll be some food and drinks provided as well for that evening. Then basically over that weekend, uh, teams will be able to get together um, in the venue from nine in the morning until 5 p.m. at night time to work together on those challenges and they'll have access to you know, a range of facilities at the venue as well um, to be able to facilitate that. Um, and myself and people from some of our other partner organisations will be available at points during those days to also provide feedback and advice as sort of needed. Um, and then on the Sunday afternoon, uh, all the teams will get together and we'll have a pitch ses session. So we'll be bringing together a, a panel of judges who'll be experts from industry and we'll announce uh, who those judges are um, at a later date. Um, but each team will be able to get up and they'll be able to present their solution uh, to the challenge that they've been working on. Uh, and then Basically, they'll be able to receive feedback from those industry judges um, and then also we'll be selecting a couple of the top proposals as well um, and we'll be having an award ceremony following that. So after the datathon, um, if there are any teams who are interested in kind of continuing the work that they're doing, um, then ourselves and also ASDAF will be available to provide some support to those teams as well um, if they're looking to sort of proceed with that. Uh, as Mortaza mentioned, he's also going to be providing some additional training uh, around using satellite imaging, uh, which I think will be really valuable. His talk today definitely gave me uh, a lot of information as someone who doesn't have a background in geospatial analytics. So he'll be providing some training on a session on uh, the Thursday prior to the Datathon event. Uh, so we'll be opening up registration for that as well. So it's not an um, obligatory training session, but if you're someone who potentially has a background in data science, but doesn't have uh, as much understanding in the geospatial area, then you'll be able to come along to that training session and learn a little bit more, become a little bit more informed. Hopefully it's a good opportunity to upskill. Um, although I do recommend that if you are forming a team, um, that you include someone in your team who does have some level of background in the geospatial uh, analytics area, uh, just to make sure that you're really equipped to look sort of at those challenges. So that is basically all of the information that I wanted to present around the datathon and the logistics of it. Um, I'm just wondering whether or not there were any questions that came through. Uh, just uh, let me have a look to new ones. No, no, all good. So we can, um, we'll post that information on our website and, and do a bunch of socials around it as well. If um, And people can always follow up with us after the questions. I am very conscious that we are running very late. So um, again, can I thank all the speakers, Kate, thank you for giving that overview. Um, and we look forward to seeing some of you at the Datathon in a couple of weeks time, which will also coincide with Data Science Week. Um, so please do also keep an eye out for all the events that we have for Data Science Week, which we'll be um, launching on the Monday before. So thank you, everyone. Um, stay safe and we'll see you soon. Thanks. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye. Good luck, everyone.